Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome. This is part two of our finance series, I guess short finance series. Uh, my name is Cole. I've already introduced myself in the last time. If you missed that, go ahead and watch the last recording. Carter, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello everybody. Uh, I'm Carter. I'm 17 years old and I'm his uh, brother. Yep. And uh, I know it sounds gimmicky, but he knows a hell of a lot more about options and that kind of thing than I do. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started off with uh, investing. And just as a disclaimer, because this is a talk about investing, um, I just want to make sure that I put this in. Neither of us are licensed investors. This is not investment advice. This is merely an explanation of what is available to you. Please don't hold us liable for any losses or gains that you may have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a fairly standard disclaimer. Um, essentially. This is not invest. This is not investment advice. This is just us educating you on what's available to you. At no point here are we going to recommend a certain stock. And if we do recommend a certain stock or option or anything, um, it's just our personal opinion and does not mean that you should actually go out and do it. Okay. Legal stuff aside, let's continue. So, what does it mean to invest? So, I was told after the last presentation that I didn't have nearly enough pictures of old white men on here for it to be a finance talk. So here's a picture of an old white man. Hopefully you're all happy now. Uh, it's also accompanied with a quote. So uh, this is some guy, Roy T. Bennett. I actually don't know who this is. I just Googled something about quotes about investing in yourself. And this is what I came up with. There is no more profitable investment than investing in yourself. The, uh, it is the best investment you can make. You can never go wrong with it. It is uh, the true way to improve yourself and be the best version of you and lets you, you be able to best serve those around you. So hopefully at least somebody took, um, took inspiration from that. So in general, what it actually means to invest is you're going to put something in something else and you're going to try and get it to do something. And I know this is really vague, but this is exactly what it means. So as an example, you can invest time in learning French with the hope of working at the Paris Microsoft office. You can invest money in school so that you can get a little piece of paper saying that you can do stuff like a degree in mathematics or computer science or design or philosophy or whatever. You could also invest effort. You can invest pretty much anything. So I have a couple of different examples on here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about primarily monetary investing. Monetary being money. We will be investing money into things and hoping that they grow in general. Uh, so does anybody have any questions on what it means to invest in something? Hopefully this is a term you're somewhat familiar with just in general life. You are currently investing your time in this talk so that you will gain the knowledge of how to do this in the future. So something that you probably heard if you are, if you've made it this far in this field and you're on this call is something along the lines of, hey, I've got this great idea for an app. It's like Uber, but for whatever. I can't pay you now, but it'll be great. It'll be great exposure and I'll give you 5% equity. And if you're lucky, you might've gotten 10% equity. And if you've never understood what this actually means, this essentially means that somebody wants you to invest in their company. If somebody comes and says, Hey, I have this great idea for an app. It's like Uber, but for dog walking, um, you know, they want you to invest your time and possibly money into their company and we in ex, in exchange we will get exposure and five percent equity in this case so what is the five percent equity um, it means that you now own five percent of this company and so there are two possible situations here if oh by the way i should mention it's not actually anywhere on the slides at all times 100 percent of the company is owned maybe you own 5% and if there's only other one if there's only one other person in the company that means they own 95% and you own 5 um, if there are 15 other people in the company you have no idea how much any of them may own um, but point is 100% has to be owned at all times 
So there are two possible situations here. It, it could turn out that your app is excellent and amazing uh, and just as cool as you thought it would be. And if the company becomes worth $20 million, you are now a millionaire because you own 5% of the company. If the company is uh, worth $20 million, 5% of $20 million is a million dollars. So this would be a good investment. If, if you invested maybe you know, three weeks of, of coding time into this or maybe $100 or maybe both, and three weeks and $100 later, you got a million dollars, most people would consider that a good investment. The other option is that your um, is that your app turns out to be worth about as much as your you know nothing. Um, and if the company is worth zero, then you're in the same position that you started at. You own five percent of the company, and five percent of zero is still zero. So this would be a bad investment. And as Jeffrey points out, it doesn't mean much if your invest in equity is illiquid. And what that means is that you own 5% of the company, but that's not cash. You can't put food on the table with 5% of a company. You have to sell that part of the company to somebody else. And we'll talk about what that means later. So who decides a company's value, right? In the previous slide, we said, what if your company becomes worth $20 million? What does it mean for a company to be worth $20 million? And who just decides that it's worth $20 million? So. And on the left, we have an example of whoever buys you out. If you're bought out, 100% of the company goes to the person or company buying you. If you own 5%, the person buying will give you 5% of the amount being paid in general. There are minutiae there that I'm not going to get into, but about that. Google, for example, bought Waze for $1 billion. Um, if you owned 20% of Waze, maybe because you were one of the early investors on it or early developers on it, you would have $200 million in cash. You would become a very, very rich person. Um, if you're curious, the reason people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are worth so much is not because they actually have this much cash. It's because they own a large portion of these companies and their companies are worth, in Musk's case, half a trillion dollars and in Bezos's case, well over a trillion dollars. Hey, so I actually have a quick question. That's sure. Okay. So um, I know that you mentioned that, like, you know, Google bought Waves for one billion, right? Say I was like a private, like, shareholder in Waves, and I owned like a couple of percent. Am I forced to sell to Way to Google at that point, since they're buying the entire company? Or yes. So effectively, in order to make those decisions, uh, you have to have uh, voting rights, right? So how do we typically vote? in the US. Uh, every I'm actually Canadian. Vote. Right, every citizen it's gets the same a vote. In Canada. Oh, okay. okay. Same <laughs> Canada. Right, so <laughs> citizens get a vote and majority wins, right? And mm -hmm. majority wins. And so in investing, it's not that everybody gets a vote, you get a vote that's proportional to how much of the company you own. And if you own 50.0000 infinite number of zeros and then a one, if you own anything more than half, you have majority control and you can control the company. Elon Musk, for example, um, does not own over 50% of the company. He owns something like 23, but he and his brother or cousin, or I think it's his brother, together own over 50%. Um, and thus he basically can't ever get fired because he has majority vote. Um, or at least did. I'm not sure if he still does. Anyways, uh, so the majority, if the majority decided to sell to Google for $1 billion, yes, you would be forced to sell. Um, there, there are some stipulations there. I'm not going to get into it. But uh, the other option for who determines your company's value are private investors. So if somebody buys part of your company for X dollars, the value of that company is determined by the proportion they bought. And what that essentially means is that if I offer you $500 for 50% of your company, I am valuing half of your company at $500, meaning I'm valuing your entire company at $1,000, right? So even if I only buy 0.1% of your company, if I buy it for a dollar, I am valuing the company at $1,000, 
right? So these tiny transactions can determine the value of a company. It doesn't matter how big the transaction actually is. So in, in this example, um, we own our 5%. And if we put in maybe time or effort in there, it becomes hard to assign a monetary value. But if we bought it for $5, our company is valued at $100. And if somebody else comes along and buys the 10% for $100, suddenly our 5% is worth $50. Because if 10% is 100, then the whole company is 1,000. And we own 5%, which is 50. Any questions on this? Can anybody determine what is or what these two have in common? Sorry, this isn't a class. I'm used to teaching. My apologies. Uh, both of these are called investors. So in general, the person or the people who decide a company's value are the people buying. Um, that's investors. Yeah, keep in mind, certain equities may not have voting rights. It, it gets complicated. Um, usually, if you own a, a percentage that is large enough to call it a percentage, you have voting rights, but not necessarily. It gets confusing, especially if you uh, divorce from your wife and you get to, she gets your shares, but you get to keep her voting rights, which is what happened with Bezos. It's a little confusing. Yeah. I'm um, going over this at a high level, as Jeffrey points out, uh, there's a lot, this can get a lot deeper, but this is a high level, right? So what are shares? So when a company goes public, it means that anybody can invest in them, right? Back in our situation where we owned 5% of this Uber vote for dog, dog walking, uh, not, you know, the only time somebody could buy is if, if, is if they approached somebody who owned part of the company and said, okay, well, they want to, you know, I want to sell my 5% to you for you know a thousand dollars right or i want to sell one percent of my five percent to you for a thousand dollars whatever right so this is hard and so typically um if a company wants to they will go public and this will let anyone invest in them but doing this percentage math is usually very very hard and so a lot of people will use shares and effectively, a share is a preset amount of the company that you can buy. And so in most companies, it is a very, very, very small percentage of the company. So I know, Carter, what was it for Apple? I think they have um, 500 million outstanding shares, or is it, is it more? No, I think it's less, but less. I think it's around four, 400 million. Okay, so if they have 400 million outstanding shares, um, that means that each share is worth, or, or is 100 divided by 400 million uh, percent. So very, very, very small. I can't do that math in my head. I'm sure somebody in chat can. But in general, um, that's how it's, it's done. You have a share that's worth a, a certain amount and it just makes it nice and easy. If you wanted to buy a percentage, you'd also have to find somebody willing to percent or to sell their percentage. So the way we get around that is by using a stock exchange, which is just like a, a, a effectively an auction house where people can buy and sell shares of companies. Um, for example, in the US, we primarily use the New York Stock Exchange, but different companies have, or sorry, companies, different countries have different exchanges and you don't have to use the one in your country, but it gets a little confusing outside. I'm not going to get too deep into that in general if you live in the US and I think most people in Canada also tend to use the New York Stock Exchange but I could be wrong. Somebody from Canada can yell at me in chat if I'm wrong. Um, I've never lived in Canada so I don't know. But and finding companies can be hard sometimes so what we do is we sometimes have indexes which will measure a certain group of stocks so it, it's just an index could be like a group of stocks so you'll often hear about the S&P 500 which is just a group of tech stocks. Um, or you'll hear about NASDAQ or the Dow. And these are different measures of how the market overall is doing by looking at a subset of every company that is publicly listed. There are, I believe, thousands of companies publicly listed. So it can get really hard to measure without these indexes. Um, Oh, S&P 500 is not tech stocks, it's all stocks? Okay, sorry. 
what's the tech stock one then? I forget. Nasdaq. Note that I'm not too, it's what? Nasdaq. Nasdaq, sorry, thank you. Note that I am not doing uh, the section on indexes. That's, uh, <laughs> and I think you're seeing why. Anyways, um, so what is uh, the price? What makes the price go up and down? So in general, if you have something that somebody else has, you're going to offer them money. And if they say no, you're going to offer them more money. So like, let's say I have a RTX 3080, uh, which is a graphics card that's in demand right now. And you offer me $800 for your RTX 3080. And some, you know, then Chris comes along and goes, hey, I'll actually offer you 900 for your 3080. Well, and then I'm going to tell you no, I'd sell to Chris instead. And then you come back and you say, well, I'll give you $1,000. And then we get into what's called scalping, but this is bidding, right? You offer more money to buy something from somebody else. And this is called bidding. And this is what makes this share price go up. This is basic supply and demand. If you've ever taken an economics class, uh, you will learn about this. And in general, um, if supply is low and demand is high, the price is going to go up. On the flip side, if you're trying to sell something and nobody wants it, you typically have a sale. We saw a lot of these at department stores over the past few years as department stores shut down. And this is because when supply is high and demand is low, prices tend to drop. This is very, very, very standard stuff. And it also applies to shares. <clears throat> so this is typically what makes prices go up and down. So before I move on, I just want to check in. Does anybody have questions on anything I've covered so far? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Excuse me. So this is all great background, but it doesn't actually tell you how to invest. So to typically buy a stock, way back in the early 1800s, you could just walk into the New York Stock Exchange. It was an office on a place called Wall Street and you could just buy stock off of somebody else. You could walk up to an investor and say, hey, what stock do you have? <laughs> And they could tell you and then you could say, I would like, you know, this much of that. And you could do that. Technically, you still can, um, but nobody does. And it's because it's very, very slow, right? Actually talking to people is slow, especially when we have computers and there's very little benefit to it. So we generically try and avoid it. Um, so typically you and people in general are going to use brokerages. I've just listed some here. This is just the ones I could think of off the top of my head. Um, don't take any of these too literally. If you want advice or recommendations, ask in either the Slack's personal finance channel or the Discord's personal finance channel. A lot of people get very opinionated on these. Um, Schwab and TD Ameritrade is actually what I use. Um, I also use Merrill Lynch, but I'm probably going to rotate out of it. Um, just because it's, I like to have all my stuff in the same spot. Uh, Robinhood used to be really, really great. Um, and it does have a really helpful and fairly intuitive interface, makes things very, very simple. Uh, they have great UI UX designers on their team. Um, and I think a lot of these other apps are going to try and work their way over. Uh, it is losing popularity, though, especially after the GameStop thing. Apparently, Weeble sucks. Okay, that's fine. It's just a name I thought of off the top of my head. And Fidelity, uh, if you work at Microsoft full-time, your 401k is going to get automatically opened with Fidelity. Um, yeah, and there are literally hundreds of brokerages, so I would not, I, I don't have the ability to list them all out here. But the point is, there are many, many options, and a lot of people are very opinionated on a lot of them. Uh, they used to have fees for buying and selling stocks, but most brokerages no longer have fees for buying or selling pretty much everything except for mutual funds. So, um, yeah. Don't use Robinhood unless you like giving away free money to Robinhood and Citadel Securities. I personally agree. But again, personal advice or personal thoughts, not advice. Uh, so market hours. In general, people... Our investors are people too. They do need sleep. They need to spend time with their families. They need to take vacations and holidays. So to help with this, the market is only open 
uh, from 9.30 to 4 Eastern Standard Time. And because it's the New York Stock Exchange located in New York, Eastern Time is typically used as a standard. So just something to keep in mind if you're investing from the West Coast. Uh, but West Coast Time, just subtract 3, it's 6.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. But also not. So a lot of brokerages will do uh, pre-market and after-market trading. And what this means is they will have their own personal, um, their own personal hours where they say, okay, look, I know that the New York Stock Exchange isn't open, but you can trade with other people on Schwab from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, Actually, I don't think Schwab goes to 8 p.m. I think they cut off at 5. But it, it, it depends on the brokerage, and you'll see it as early as 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, it can really depend. Typically, pre-market and post-market hours are much more volatile. And what that means is that the price will move around a lot because um, prices on stocks are typically steady because you'll have a lot of people trying to buy and a lot of people trying to sell. And... I'm sure you know, uh, if you've ever tried to buy something on eBay, it's a lot easier for the price to change a lot if there's only one person selling or one person buying. But it's a lot harder when there's hundreds or thousands or even millions of people trying to buy or sell. So in general, the pre-market and after-market can move around a lot more, but it is an option, technically. I don't know why people do this themselves because now they've got to be awake more, whatever. Not my business. The best and really the only trading advice um, that anybody can ever really give you without being just kind of objectively wrong is buy low and sell high. That's, or sorry, subjectively wrong. Uh, that's basically it. That's pretty much the only um, objectively correct advice. So in general, if you buy 50% of some company, let's say Microsoft, when it is worth you know, maybe $100 and being run out of Bill Gates's garage, and then you wait uh, 40 years or however long it's been, and you sell your 50% in 2022, when it's a $1.8 trillion country or company, you are now the richest person in the world owning $900 billion. Um, now, in actuality, if you're trying to sell 50%, uh, the supply suddenly just became high and the price will probably drop, but in general. So that is the, the general way to make money. So the normal order is called buying stock. You buy stock when it's low and then you sell it when it's high. The reverse is called shorting stock. And this, I'm sure you've probably heard of it in the news. It's what ha caused the prices of GME to go Absolutely crazy. GME, by the way, is the ticker, which is essentially the identification for uh, stock, and it happens to be for GameStop. But um, Microsoft, by the way, is MSFT. Excuse me. Um, and this is just what you'll type into your brokerage to find a certain thing. But a lot of brokerages now will go by name as well. Anyways, the to short a stock, you sell stock you don't have and then buy it back later at what is hopefully a lower price. So if I sell you, um, you know, 10% uh, or, or if I sell you 10 shares of Microsoft for $500, right? You are happy because you bought 10 shares of Microsoft for $500 because you think it's worth $500. And then when you actually want to do something with it, you will ask, you will need these shares, but you don't actually have them because you bought essentially the promise of 10 shares off of me. So I have to go out now and actually buy it. And if this price has gone down, I have sold you 10 shares for $500 and then bought those 10 shares for less, which means I've made money. If it's gone up, I could lose money, could lose a lot of money, which is what the hedge funds are getting into. But in general, you're not going to do much shorting stock. In fact, most brokerages will not let you short stock without a whole bunch of other thing hoops to jump through. And I'm not really going to get into that too much. So in general, what you're going to be doing is called buying stock, um, which is where 
the price drops, you buy it, and then the price goes up and you probably sell it. Or maybe you just hold on to it forever because it's your retirement or something. Who knows? Um, in general, there are, I don't have a slide for this, but there are three groups of plays for a stock. There's short-term, medium-term, and long-term. A short-term play might be if you have a, um, if you have a stock that you know is super low this morning, but you think it's going to be high by five o'clock or by three o'clock, you might buy it in the morning and then sell it later in the day, or you might buy it on Monday and sell it on Wednesday, right? That would be a short-term stock. If you buy it and sell it in the same day, that's called day trading. There are certain limits on what you can do there, but you can Google that. In general, you just need to have $25,000 uh, in the account, but I'm not going to get into that too much. Medium terms, typically on the order of months, and long term is typically on the order of years. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, play is how long you intend to hold the stock before you sell it. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Any questions about stocks? Uh, because this is kind of the foundation for about basically everything else we're going to cover. So I want to make sure that you all have this like really down pat. All right, I think we're good. Then Carter, go ahead and take it away. Absolutely. Um, would it mess up your recording if um, I did the sharing the screen? Yes, it would, but okay. you can just say slide and I'll advance the slide. All right, cool. Then yeah, we'll just coordinate. All right, so yeah, we're gonna be going over um, ETFs, mutual funds uh, and options. And we're also gonna be talking about a little bit of uh, Greeks. So if you guys don't know what that is, uh, what are you gonna learn? So slide. So we're gonna go over what a stock index is. Um, so a stock index is sort of a, uh, it's a broad subset of the market. It's sort of just a numerical representation of how the market's doing. Uh, you can't, it's important to note that you can't actually, um, you can't buy a stock index. Uh, you can only like look at it. So slide. Um, these are some of the most popular stock indexes. Uh, Cole just mes mentioned the um, S&P 500, which is the 500 biggest um, stocks by market cap. And then we've got the Dow Jones, which is the 30 biggest companies. Uh, and the NASDAQ, it just tracks the NASDAQ. And then the New York Stock Exchange Composite. The uh, DAX is for Germany. Uh, it's the top 30 securities on the um, uh, Frankfurt Stock Exchange. And the FTSE is the uh, British top 100 mm -hmm. British companies. FTSE. Yeah. Um, by the way, market cap um, is short for market capitalization. It is how much the company is, is worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's the valuation of the company. Exactly. Um, yeah. So slide. So we're going to go over um, index funds. Uh, so an index fund is sort of like a fund that is supposed to emulate the uh, performance of an index, um, or at least it tries its best. So we just said, uh, you guys just learned about the um, S&P 500. I think a lot of everyone, uh, I think everyone knows about that. The index fund for the S&P 500 is, uh, the ticker is SPY, um, sometimes abbreviated just to just SPY. Um, and uh, it emulates the S&P 500. Uh, it's an ETF, by the way, which is an exchange traded fund. So there's two types of index funds, uh, exchange traded funds, so ETFs and just mutual funds. So, before I move on, does anyone have any uh, questions? Okay, awesome. Um, by the way, if, if I'm going too fast or if I'm disorganized or anything, you guys can just ask me a question. I'll, uh, I'll try my best to answer it. So slide, please. All right, mutual funds. So uh, yeah, mutual funds are put together by individual investors. Um, they try to replicate an index uh, or most often I think they, um, they try to like value invest to, to pick stocks that will try and do better than the market. Um, so mutual funds, a lot of the time you'll see them uh, harvest dividends, uh, meaning they'll pick stocks with high dividend returns and, uh, and use those to, to give you money basically. Um, and they, uh, an ex another example of mutual funds is they, uh, they're stock pickers. So, they try to value invest, which means um, sort of like Cole said, uh, 
if you were to invest in Microsoft when it was still being run out of uh, Bill Gates's garage, that would be a value investment. You'd be holding that long term uh, to um, because you believe in the company. And so that's what a lot of mutual funds do. They, they try to pick uh, maybe IPOs, which are new stocks in the market um, and or companies that they deem undervalued. Yep. Thank you, Chris, for jumping in there. I was about to say, so a dividend, in case you're not familiar with the term, is a company may want people to just hold on to their stock because remember, if the company, if everybody sells the stock, then the company goes down in value. And a lot of times the company likes to stay up in value. So they will pay you just to hold on to the stock. Um, I think some of the more or higher yield dividends include like, this is just off the top of my head, includes Seagate which has a about 6% dividend. So if you just hold a hundred dollars, no, is that wrong? Uh, no, it's much lower than 6%, but yeah. Okay. I thought it was 6%, but whatever it is, let's say it's 5%. Um, even if it's not, let's just say it is for now. If you held a hundred dollars of Seagate for a year, you would at the end of the year, regardless of whether or not the price went up or down, you would have gained 6% of what you held. Um, it's computed in a little bit more of a funky way, but in general, a dividend is somebody pays you just to hold on to the stock and not sell it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, dividends usually, by the way, are paid uh, quarterly or monthly or annually. Uh, we've got some questions here. Okay. Um, no, it's uh, so great, great question, Monty. The dividends are paid out in cash, yeah. Uh, uh, Cardi, can you read the question cool. before answering it? Cause it doesn't show up on the recording. Oh, sorry. Um, Monty asked, how are dividends paid out in more stock or like in cash? And the, uh, the answer is cash. Uh, they are, they just give you cash. Basically the, uh, the stocks, sorry, the, um, companies give you cash for holding the uh, stock. It is, um, it is a percentage of how many, how many shares you own of the company. So that's important to keep in mind. Yep. And as, uh, Jeffrey pointed, or as, uh, Chris pointed out in chat, you do usually want to just automatically reinvest that cash. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Most brokerages will actually have a have an option to automatically reinvest dividends, mm -hmm. um, and it's usually company. checked by default. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we can go to ETFs now. I think uh, we skipped over that actually. What? Yeah, I think we skipped over a slide. Yeah. Oh, ETFs. sorry. That's a problem. Um, so an ETF is the other type of index fund. Um, it's what SPY is, what I just uh, talked about. So basically the main difference between a mutual fund and ETF is that ETFs are traded throughout the day. So a mutual fund will be calculated, the price will be calculated at the end of the day. Uh, but ETFs try to replicate an, ind uh, an index um, and they uh, do allow dividends, same as mutual funds. So uh, slide please. So Buffett's advice um, is just invest in SPY. We've mentioned that a lot so far. It's just because it's a good investment. Um, it tracks the market. It tracks the uh, top 500 stocks. Most of them are blue chip, which, sorry, blue chip means uh, they're, they're good investments. Uh, it's like a good company. There's no like quantitative uh, area you could put into a blue chip stock, but usually um, like Apple or Amazon, blue chip companies, just high tier. Um, so yeah, uh, the average annual return on SPY is 7% per year. Uh, right now it's actually up, I think 30%. So that's, it's really, it's just a solid investment. It went up two and a half percent today. Mm -hmm. The highest gain it's had in nine months. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy today. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions? There's a lot here and it's about to get more complicated. Yes. Make sure you're solid on the fundamentals. All right. I'm going to assume no questions. All right. So yeah. Um, so we're getting into options guys. And Oops, if you don't, sorry. no problem. If you don't know what these are, that's okay. Uh, if you don't pick them up immediately, that is also okay. These are very complicated topics. And I, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, everyone, you know, Cole and I are certainly learning about options a little more each day. <laughs> um, you know, and these, these are complicated topics. All right. So slide. Uh, actually, before I get in there. Okay. So I, I, I do just want to mention there are typically uh, risk and reward trade-offs. 
So I do just want to give you a quick ranking for these. Um, in general, as with Buffett's advice, ETFs tend to be fairly low risk, but also fairly low reward. 7% gain over the course of a year is definitely um, nice, but it, it's uh, for a lot of investors that would be considered fairly low reward. Um, so ETFs tend to be lower risk, lower reward. Uh, mutual funds can be high or low, it depends on the mutual fund, right? That's just somebody else choosing what to invest in. Um, stocks are in the medium there and options are typically considered to be higher risk, higher reward, but that's not always the case. And Carter's gonna talk about that in a minute. But just something keep to keep in mind when you're deciding how much you want to invest and where. Yeah. Yeah, so we're gonna go over some terminology. If you guys have these uh, slides open um, on your own computer, it would, it, it would be nice to uh, keep the slide open. I've, uh, I've color coded most things uh, to make it easier maybe to understand. But um, yeah, so we're gonna go over these now. So the strike price is the uh, price at which you can buy the seller stock if you choose to exercise the option. So um, we're gonna talk about exercising in a second. It's okay. Uh, we're we're going to come back to this terminology and uh, you'll maybe understand it more. The expiration date is the um, date at which the contract becomes void. Um, so you can't trade a options contract after the expiration date. Think of it like a coupon. Exactly. Yeah. In terms of holding an options contract in the money is when you're uh, selling the contract would benefit you. And out of the money is when selling the contract would not benefit you. And premium, an important one, is the, um, the current price of the options contract. So it's going to be what you're going to need to pay to obtain the contract um, as a whole. All right, slide. Yeah, so we've got um, different terminology. Uh, the open interest is the number of co uh, options contracts currently in play. So it's just the amount of people that are currently holding uh, an options contract or the specific options contract that you're looking at. The volume is the, um, the number of contracts traded that day. Uh, the volume means the same thing on, uh, with stock, by the way, too. So it's the amount of stocks traded per day. The volume with options is the amount of options traded, options contracts traded per day. Uh, yeah, and they have to be bought and sold. The break even, also another important one. Um, it's the, uh, it's the, so it's the price, it's the amount of money um, in which the asset must be sold to cover the costs of acquiring and owning it. And we're gonna talk about how that's calculated uh, next slide. Yep. It's a fancy term for the price at which you make exactly nothing and lose exactly nothing. Yeah, so you want your, uh, you want your contract to be above your break even. All right, so break even. Um, we're going to talk about what calls and puts mean in a second. So don't worry if you don't know what that means. But the um, this is how you calculate break even. It's the strike price in the terms of calls. It's the strike price plus the premium equals the break even. And for puts, the strike price minus the premium. Pretty simple calculation. Not too bad. And uh, yeah, so we're going to go over the, what the definition of an option is. So. I'm, I'm just going to read this word for word because I think it's the best uh, description of what an option is. An option is the contract which gives the owner the right to buy or sell a stock at the uh, specific strike price um, before a certain date. Uh, in order to buy this contract, the owner must pay a premium to the seller. So we just talked about the premium. The premium, it's important to note, by the way, the premium is the max, uh, it's the amount of money you can lose. So it's also important to note that um, options, um, they represent a hundred shares of the underlying security. So if I buy one contract, one options contract, I've bought a hundred shares in the term of a, a call. If I buy one call contract, I've bought a hundred shares, um, the equivalent of a hundred shares of the company. It's, that's pretty oversimplified, but you can just think of it in terms of that. So um, when you go to buy an options contract, um, you're going to see numbers like 1.5 or 0.45. This is the premium. Um, it looks pretty cheap, but know that the, uh, 
it's times 100 because you're trading increments of 100 shares. So if you're paying $1.5 uh, dollars for a, um, an options contract, it's actually worth $150 because it's times 100. Exactly, yep. Chris. Um, you've got the right to buy 100 shares. Exactly. It's a, it's a contract. Uh, so does anyone have any questions on that before we continue? All right. Very well. So there are two types of options. There's only two. Uh, they've got a call option and a put option. So we're going to go over the call option first. A call option is the right to buy a security at a certain price, which is the strike price, before a certain date in the future. So, and the same thing, you need to pay a premium to the seller to obtain the contract. For, for your mental purposes, you can swap out the word security for like stock. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just that contracts don't have to be for stocks, which is why we use security instead of stock. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You can actually buy uh, options contracts for like Bitcoin or water. Yeah. So recently make... water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough. Um, so sorry, I should have put this in the slide earlier, but bullish and bearish. I don't know if you guys know those terms. Bullish is when you believe uh, right. pos uh, stock should be uh, positive and bearish is when you believe the uh, stock is going to be negative return. Right. So, so if you're bullish on a stock, you think it's going to go up. Exactly. So a call option is bullish because when you buy a call option, you're going to make money if the stock goes up and you don't want to lose money. All right. So uh, slide. So the other type of option is a put option and this is bearish. So you want it to go down when you buy a put option and a put option is the right to sell a security. So to short it basically at a certain price before a date in the future. And same thing, you need, a, you need to pay a premium to, um, to obtain the, the option. And uh, it's, it's helpful to think of calls and puts are just inverse of each other. They're just completely the opposite, but they're, they are the same idea. Okay, so we're gonna get into a little bit of technical stuff. So does anyone have any questions? This is all cumulative. So if you have any questions, let, let, let me know. Are the premiums related to the strike price? Yes, absolutely. So we're gonna talk about that in a second, but the, um, the closer the, the current stock price is to the strike price on your option, the higher the premium is going to be. Right, so no, I think of it this way. Um, Microsoft stock is at, let's pretend it's at $240. If I sold you the right to buy 100 shares of Microsoft stock from me at $200, right? What should I sell that right for so that I don't lose money? Right? If Microsoft is currently at $240 each and I'm giving you the right to buy a hundred shares at two hundred dollars. I, um, I would effectively lose forty dollars of potential earnings per share. So forty dollars times a hundred, because the contract is a hundred. So I would want to sell this option for, or for a premium of four thousand dollars. That would be an absurdly expensive uh, option, FYI. That's not really well. I guess that is realistic, but it's not one that you typically buy. Um, but yeah, and you might still buy it if you thought instead of being at, you know, 20 or 240, if you thought it was going to go up to 280, you'd still make money from that, right? So nothing wrong with that. But if I were to sell you the right to buy 100 shares at 240, and it's already at 240, right? That premium is going to be way, way lower. You're not going to buy that right for $4,000. That's insane, right? Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, Carter. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. Um, yeah, I actually messed up my definition, uh, my explanation earlier. It's not, it's not the closer to the strike price. It's if you're deeper in the money, the premium is going to be more expensive. Right. All right. So yeah, we can do. So we're gonna talk about some Greeks here. Um, the Greeks are just uh, values to um, help the uh, purchaser or the seller really uh, decide what's gonna happen with the contract. Um, it's okay if you don't get that. We're just going to talk about the Greeks uh, and, and see what they mean. 
So the delta uh, is the amount your position goes up or down for each one dollar increase or decrease in the stock Ooh, I'm price. I'm so sorry. And the uh, gamma is is it's easy to think of the gamma as like the delta of delta. It's the same definition, but for delta. So it's the amount of delta, the amount the delta goes up for uh, or up or down for every one dollar uh, increase or decrease in the stock price. It's the derivative of delta. Exactly. So delta changes based on the stock price. Gamma changes delta based on the stock price. So sorry, delta changes your position and gamma changes delta. Right. Yeah. So um, good to know that delta for for stocks is one and gamma is zero. So we just uh, learned what these mean. Uh, when you buy a share of the company, like let's say you buy a share of Apple, Apple goes up by one dollar. You're making one dollar you, because you have one share. So that's just how it works. Delta is always going to be one for stocks, and gamma is always going to be zero because you're never going to make more money the more Apple goes up. Um, it is important to note that they are not one and zero for uh, options contracts. They will be different numbers, and we'll check those out, check those out in a bit. All right. So implied volatility, really important concept. Um, there's a lot of words on this page. You don't need to. You don't need to know a lot of, about this. It's it's really complicated, but the uh, TLDR is just um, it's really important uh, to factor the the options prices. It's really important in the decision to uh, make options prices what they are. Um, if IV is high, option prices are expensive. If IV is low, then option prices are very cheap. So what IV is implied volatility is if let's say um, stock X uh, is at $50 and it goes to $100 in two days. So that's a 100% increase in two days. That's, Stop. Yeah, it came up. Um, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's incredible. Uh, that means implied volatility. So the volatility of the stock is now, it's, it's measured as a percent, percentage, by the way. It's now going to be very high. Um, so this means it has a big chance of s big swings. Um, these in turn will make the delta, sorry, it will, it will make the uh, options price more expensive because for each option, it will have a higher chance of reaching the strike price if big swings happen. Right, so as an example that's happening right now, GameStop is currently rising and falling between 30 and 50% almost every day. If you know a stock is going to go up and down 30 and 50 or 30 to 50 percent, are you going to sell somebody the right to buy a stock anywhere within 30 to 50 percent of the current price? Probably not, because the odds of it swinging that high are actually fairly high. So you're going to set your strike price for your option if you're offering it very, very, very differently than the current price, right? If I own, if I were to give somebody the right to buy. 50 share or 100 shares of GameStop at $50, I would probably charge something around $6,000 for that because the odds of GameStop going from 50 to 100 are still quite high if the volatility is high. If the volatility is low and it typically stays around $50, odds of that happening are very low and thus the price would go way, way down. Yeah, exactly. Um, actually at GameStop's peak, uh, when it was at like, uh, what was it? It was like $400. Uh, it was, yeah. At its highest, it was 485, I believe. Yeah. So when it was at like around 480, I checked the implied volatility on some of the options contracts. I saw like 850% implied volatility, Jeez. which oh. is just the highest I've ever seen ever. Uh, that was good. Yeah. How was yours? Uh, I think somebody's off mute. Here, I'll find you and mute you. I found you. You have been muted. Okay. All right. My apologies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, no worries. Um, so, high IV occurs when the stock price moves rapidly in a short amount of time, and a low IV occurs when the stock price doesn't move in a long amount of time. So, this leads into our next topic um, a really important scenario that you guys are going to have to learn when you're trading options. It's called an IV crush. So it's, it's when you lose a bunch of money or 
sorry, that's that's in terms of holding it. It's when the IV goes down rapidly because the stock does not move. So I've got uh, AMD right here for the past six months. Uh, this was actually, slide was built um, earlier. So that's not what it looks like now, but it, you still get the picture. Um, you see AMD advanced micro devices rose sh quite sharply earlier. And uh, you can see the arrow saying IV plummeted here. It's because the stock didn't really move after moving a large amount. So let's say IV was at 200% when AMD was shooting up and then it just ceased to move, IV could have plummeted down to like 40%. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're holding that contract, uh, I mean, you've made a lot of money when it was going up, but if you held it through uh, the peak, you've suddenly lost a bunch of money. Even though the stock hasn't gone down, you've suddenly lost a bunch of money because your option price has gone down because IV has gone down. Right. And a way to think about this is like, if I had, um, you know, if I bought, if, if AMD is skyrocketing, it's gone up $50 or $20 a day every day for the past four days. Right. And currently it's at a hundred dollars and I, or let's say $80 and I buy the right to, uh, buy a hundred shares of AMD at $80. Whoever sold that to me, probably is expecting it to hit $100 tomorrow and 120 the day after and 140 the day after that. So they're probably going to sell it to me for a huge premium, right? I'm going to pay a ton for this contract because I think it's also going to go up that high. And then it suddenly stops. And the odds of it hitting 140 go from maybe 50% down to basically like 2%. Suddenly me selling that, that contract at that or, you know, for that premium is practically non-existent. Nobody is going to buy that contract because nobody thinks it's going to go up to $140 anymore, right? Because you can just look at the graph, right? If something's been holding the same price for the past few days, odds of it just randomly spiking up are fairly low. So that that's effectively what's happening. here. Yeah. Um, and it's important to know IV crush can go both ways. So when GameStop was falling, uh, like by... 80% per day or something, uh, IV also is high. So IV goes both ways. Um, yeah. All right, next slide. All right, does anyone have any questions? Sorry. All right. Well, then we did a very good job of explaining this because it's a pretty complicated topic. Yeah, or people are lost, but let's, yeah. let's hope for the primer, or the former. <laughs> let's hope, okay. Uh, good news. You don't need to know anything about this. Um, this is just, you should know it exists. It's called, um, so option prices are calculated using something called the Black-Scholes model. Um, different exchanges around the world use different variations, but um, this is just the general equation of how option prices are calculated. You don't need to know what any of this means. It's just, it's important that you know that there's just something behind it and it is accurate. Right. And if you if you actually spend the time to go through it and logic it out, you'll notice it actually does make sense, like intuitively, if you think about it. But I hate math. All right. So this is um, sort of a section of an option, options chain. So it's sort of like putting together what we've just learned. Can you define options chain? Yeah, sure. A, an options chain is like it's showing a bunch of different strike prices. It's, it's showing all the contracts for either the call side or the put side. Right, meaning I might be offering, you know, 100 shares of AMD at $100. You know, Jeffrey might be offering 100 shares of AMD at $110. Uh, you know, Simon might be offering 100 shares of AMD at $120, right, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's like the marketplace basically. Um, it's, it's you where you can pick up different, different contracts at different valuations. So we've got the uh, bid and the ask. Um, important things, the bid is where the, um, the buyer is bidding for. So there, the bid is the, the buyer is trying, the average buyer is trying to buy at that price. I will the buy ask. this for $40. Mm -hmm. And the ask is what the seller is trying to sell it for. So that the, of course, the seller is trying to get um, as much money out of it as possible. 
uh, but obviously the buyers don't think it's worth as much. Right. Well, I'm not going to sell it to you for 40 bucks, but I'll sell it to you for 55. Yeah. And so that's, that creates what's called the mark. Uh, fancy term, it's just synonymous with median. So it's the, it's the difference between the bid and the ask. It's usually around what you're going to be paying for the options contract. Um, obviously, it would be great if we could uh, get the bid price. And sometimes I actually have gotten great fills. Uh, I have gotten close to the bid price, but um, never, never exactly. So the mark is usually going to be what you're paying. Um, you're probably going to have to go a little bit higher than the mark if you want to get a fill immediately, a fill in the order. Um, cause options aren't like stocks. You can't just immediately purchase one, uh, you know, just like at market rate is what he's yeah. referring to. Yeah. You so can't market just... rate just says I will buy a hundred share or whatever. I'll buy some shares of the stock at whatever the lowest anybody's offering it at is. I don't really care what it is. I just want it. You can't do that with options. Mm. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to ignore a uh, previous close high and low. Cause those are just wrong in this case. Um, the volume is the, uh, so we actually went over earlier. It's the um, amount of people that traded this uh, contract today. You can see that the volume is um, incredibly lower than what would be on a stock. Like let, uh, let's say, I think uh, AMD had a volume of 3 million today. It's probably higher than that, honestly. But um, it's usually every stock that you'll see uh, in the market has a volume of around millions. So why is this volume so low? Well, this is a specific, specific stock, Apple, and it's specific options contract. Um, it's the one. Yeah, AMD had a volume of 33 million and its yeah. average volume is 44 million. Yeah, so this only has a volume of 2,500. So it's important to check the volume always before purchasing an options contract because if the volume's like under 20, you might actually get screwed, even though like, let's say your options contract is really profitable. If nobody's there to buy it, you can't sell it. So it's always important to check the volume before you purchase an options contract. In this case, it's 2,500, it's, it's fine. You're, you're gonna have no problem selling it. Open interest is actually more important. Uh, we went over that earlier. It's the uh, amount of contracts um, currently in play. So right now there's 632 people holding the 122 strike price. Uh, Apple call. And that's just what open interest means. There's, yeah. Implied volatility, we just went over earlier. Uh, 36%. Good. It's a good solid uh, volatility and means Apple's not going to be too crazy and jump all over the place. Um, usually, uh, an implied volatility under like 50% is going to be like solid. Uh, I wouldn't say high IV is bad. It's just uh, you have a higher chance of making money and a higher chance of losing money when the implied volatility is high. Yeah, and the delta and gamma, we just talked about this earlier. So um, the delta is 0.49. Uh, so what does that mean if Apple raises by one, uh, one dollar? So if Apple raises by one dollar, it goes to, um, I think the share price is, yeah, so the share price when I took this picture was 121. So if it goes to 122.70, our contract, this $122 call, is going to be worth, um, so it's worth 450 now. That's the premium. It's going to be worth 499 uh, if Apple goes up one dollar. Does everyone understand that? It's because the delta is 0.49, and the delta affects the premium of the contract. All right, cool. And the delta after that happens, after Apple's at 122.70, the delta is going to be worth 0.03 more. So the more Apple goes up, the more you're going to make money. Uh, we're going to ignore Vega and Rho for now. Um, they are important. Well, Rho's not really, but Vega, you, you're going to have time to learn about that later. Uh, it's not important to our lesson right now. So the strike price is what you're trying to get the, um, you're trying to get Apple to be above. So it's what, it's what uh, you can, I, sh I, I can't use the word exercise. I should have gone over exercise before showing this, but um, it's basically what you need your uh, options contract to uh, be it's what you sorry it's what you need the price of the option uh, price of the um, stock to be above but that's not exactly true is it because we've got the break even so it costs us four dollars and fifty cents to buy this contract right now or at the time i took this picture so what does that mean for uh when we're going to start making money well we're going to start making money if apple 
goes above 126.50. That's our break even, right? Because the strike price plus the premium, which is 450, so you've got 122 plus 450, and this is a call, so it's plus. Uh, that may that means it's uh, 126.5. So you're not going to make money until Apple is above 126.5. Right, and so it's also worth remembering that uh, a contract is the right to buy a certain number of shares. So when you're exercising that contract, you're exercising the right. You're actually going to the person that wrote you that contract and saying. Hey, remember when you said I could buy 100 shares of Apple for, in this case, $122? I would like to actually do that. And if Apple is above 126, you can then oops, you can then immediately turn around and take those 100 shares that you just bought and or that you just got from him and then sell them. And you'll make whatever you're you are above 126.50 times 100 because there's 100 shares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's above 122, so, oh, okay, sorry, that wasn't a question. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so if it's below 122, actually, in this case, if it's below 126.5 uh, and you exercise it, you're actually losing money. So don't exercise it. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, no, you actually, you still would. If it's above 122, but below 126, um, you may still want to exercise it to help cut your losses, right? Yeah, you might okay. still lose money here, but it would be better than, you know, losing all your money. If it's below 122, then there's no point in doing it at all because you'd be buying it for more for more than it's actually worth. Yeah, exactly. Good correction. Um, yeah. So you might want to cut your losses by exercising early and for a loss. Right. Yeah. Or uh, just don't exercise at all. You, remember, you, know, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, slide. So we're going to talk about the Sorry. risk. We're going to talk about the risk profile of an option. Um, if you guys are just starting out buying options or you plan to buy options in the future, uh, optionsprofitcalculator.com will become your best friend. It's uh, very nice. Um, and yeah, so we can, we can see right here, this is the Apple call I was talking about earlier, um, expiring March 26th at 122. So you can see as this graph, um, ignoring the break even right now, let's just say our break even is 122. Uh, if it expires, uh, below 122, you're losing everything. You're losing 100% of the premium you paid for. Um, and obviously, you know, if Apple goes up 100%, uh, sorry, if Apple goes to uh, 130, let's say, you're making 100% basically. Uh, and that's going to be quite nice. So whatever you paid for the premium, double it. And that's what you're going to be getting if you sell the option at 100% profit. Um, so what you guys can see here is that uh, I think the zoom might actually be covering it, but on the side, it shows all the dates, um, how far away the expiration date is. Um, basically, the top is far away expiration date and the bottom is not far away. Other way around. Uh, no, the, the bottom is March 27th. So that's the right, which is the farther expiration. away than the 28th of February. No, sorry. I mean, it's, it's close to the expiration date. Like it's, got it, it's got it. on expiration. Yeah. So bottom is, is close to expiration. Top is far away from expiration. Um, as you can see, the farther away the, uh, from the expiration you are, your contract's going to be worth more money than it would be closer to the expiration. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? All right. I hope I didn't lose you there because we got some fun stuff to talk about. So yeah, we, we just talked about exercising an option. Probably should have put the slide sooner, but it's okay. Um, to exercise an option means to put in effect the right specified uh, in the options contract. So it's basically just like cashing in on the contract. It's making, making do of what the contract says. Um, important note, you don't have to exercise an option. In fact, most of the people who buy an option don't actually exercise. Uh, let's talk about that Apple call 122. Uh, if you were to exercise it and Apple, let's say, was 121, you would need to buy 100 shares of Apple at $121. Most people don't have that capital. I mean, you guys might because they're all Microsoft interns. Capital but... meaning money on hand. Yeah, capital meaning money on hand. <laughs> um, but, you know, it requires a lot of capital to exercise an option generally. Um, 
unless you're dealing with a, a stock that isn't very expensive. But um, I don't see many people exercising options for like Amazon per se, with, which is $3,500, 3300 mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're exercising okay. the option when it's closed, sometimes lend or brokerages will temporarily lend you because it's literally only for a millisecond. They'll lend you like hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's only yours for a millisecond. But um, <laughs> in yeah. general, yeah. Yeah, like uh, last weekend, I don't have $3 million, but I controlled three million, uh, a little over $3 million worth of um, SPY, the uh, index we just talked about, uh, just because I got loaned the money temporarily. Um, I was never actually in control of it, but I got loaned the money to exercise an option that I had. So right. that's pretty cool. You, 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 can, you guys can see how people are just getting like shit rich off of just uh, trading options because it's leveraged by so much and you can pay so little to have such big leverage. That's when you unplug your router. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the common advice is if you go negative uh, on your brokerage, just delete the app. They can't really you know, do anything. I'm, I'm kidding. It's a joke. Okay. Um, so trading an option. So this is actually where most of the money is. Um, I think Cole likes to exercise his options because he's a gangster, but um, I, I usually just trade options. Uh, so there are important things to note things that affect the price of the contract is the theta, which is another Greek. Um, I don't actually know if we talked about that yet, but it's just the time value. It's just the time value. So usually you'll see a, actually not usually, you'll see a, a value of theta, um, like let's say 0.11. So for that means every day, uh, your contracts that you hold will be decreasing in value by 0.11. Um, yeah, so it's it's also important to note that um, the, this isn't linear. Theta isn't linear. It's actually squared by the amount of time that you have left. So the closer you get to expiration, the just the higher and higher losses you're gonna you're gonna eat because of the theta decay. Right. So you can again or put an analogy to this. If I buy or if I sell you the right to buy a hundred shares of let's say Apple, because we've been using Apple for some reason. If I, or no, let's use Microsoft because, you know, if I buy, if I sell you the right to buy 100 shares of Microsoft at, you know, 240 bucks uh, and you have five days left for the, for that, for the price to go up, odds are you'll be willing to pay more for it than if you have maybe 30 minutes and the option's going to expire in 30 minutes. Odds of it going up are going to be fairly low. So you're probably not going to spend a whole lot on that contract, right? So as it gets closer to the expiration, the price of that contract is going to go way, way down. And that's determined by theta. Yeah. Um, any questions before we move on? We're going to be talking about intrinsic and extrinsic value. Any questions? I know this is a lot. Feel free to watch this again, except on like maybe times 0.5 speed or something. Mm. <laughs> or two yeah. if we're talking slow. Uh, and you guys, um, the internet is always helpful. You can look up pretty much everything. Um, and to be honest, trading, uh, trading options is the best way to learn about them. So you can, you can set up a paper account with like, that means just not real money with like TD Ameritrade. And you can learn a bunch about options just by trading fake money. Uh, yeah. And TD Ameritrade will always have the correct contract values. And- it basically does the math to say like, if you did actually have this money, here's how much money you would have made or lost. Like if mm. you did actually buy this contract. Yeah. And sorry, it's a thinkorswim, not TD Ameritrade that has that. Okay, so intrinsic value. Um, intrinsic value is just the, con- it's, the uh, it's the value of the contract if it were exercised just currently. So we're back to this Apple call. Um, we actually got the 123 call this time. So uh, let's just go over what this annotation means right here. We've got plus one, which means it's just one contract of the, uh, of of the uh, position of the of the options contract. Twenty six March twenty one is the expiration date. Um, that's that's why it's yellow. So it's just uh, about twenty days from now, twenty five days from now. March twenty sixth, twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty one. AAPL is the ticker, so that's just the ticker for Apple. 
Um, three is just, uh, that's actually incorrect. Sorry, we're gonna ignore the three for now. <laughs> um, it's it, usually that number, uh, I think TD Ameritrade displays it, that that number would usually signify how many days left till expiration you have. Apparently I'm really bad at math. So it's not three days till expiration. I think it's 25 days if today is March 1st. So yeah, so you've got, that should be a 25, yeah. Yeah, let's fix it. awesome. 123C means it's a call. That's what the C means with 123 as, an, uh, as a strike price. And at $5 is the premium. So it's the price that you paid to uh, obtain the contract. So um, this, in this example, the, uh, option, the value of the option is $5. So if you were to ex exercise the options contract now, you'd make $3. Um, because the strike price minus the actual share price. So um, $3 is the intrinsic value. Does everyone understand that? $3 is the intrinsic value because if you were to exercise it now, you'd get the difference, which is $3. Time, yeah. Yeah, which, which is times 100, so $300. Okay. So now we have to ask, them, ask the question, why is there two, still $2 left on the uh, contract? Because the premium was $5. So where does this $2 come from? That's where extrinsic value comes in. This is also known as time decay or theta value or time value. Extrinsic value is the value left on the contract based on the fact that there's still time left. So just like we said earlier, the extra uh, time uh, the theta is going to be uh, um, increasing as it gets as the closer it gets to the expiration date. So the extrinsic value on a contract, let's say two days before expiration, is going to be much less than it were, let's say, four months from expiration. So um, yeah, that I think that covers it for extrinsic value. Any questions on intrinsic or extrinsic value? Right, so your in, your personal intrinsic value might be the sum of how much your organs would sell on the black market. Your extrinsic value would be the amount that you know you could bring in if you were forced to work for a company like Microsoft for the rest of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your extrinsic value would be, uh, I guess, if the organ example. If you were like ninety five, your extrinsic value would be low because the organ right. would be useful. That's a, yeah, if you were 95, dark. your intrinsic and extrinsic value would both go down. But yeah. Yeah, that was a dark I get example. what you mean. Yeah. I don't know. I, I went with it. Anyway, um, so we've got an options chain here. So that's what I talked about earlier. Uh, I think this is a TD Ameritrade's option chain. Um, I have no idea. Action. This isn't my picture. If anyone uses TD Ameritrade, feel free to correct me. But um, yeah, so we've got everything here. We've got the calls on the left side the uh, puts on the right side. Um, so everything in blue, you can see a, a faint blue outline. That's, um, that means it's, the contract is in the money. So the strikes in the center uh, are the strike prices. Um, I don't actually see a share price, but we're gonna have I to- I think that's it right there. Oh yeah, so 948, yeah. So it's in between the 950, 947.5 uh, contract. Um, yeah, so the, the blues are in the money and the everything that not in blue is out of the money. Uh, as you can see, the uh, price of the contract goes up. Actually, you can't see that well because the mark isn't displayed, I don't think. But the, the, uh, the um, options contract, uh, the options value does go up the deeper in the money you get. So yeah. You can These, see you can see the bid and the ask, but you can't see the mark. Mm -hmm. So the mark would just be in this case seven or seven point one five, so seven dollars fifteen cents. Yeah, and they get more expensive as you go farther up. Right. Yep. Because you're more in the money, right? It makes far more sense if you're likely to make money to charge more for that contract, whereas down here you're very likely to not make money, and thus the options are cheaper. All right, so we're gonna talk about leaps now. Uh, looks scary. It's not, it's a pretty simple concept. It's, uh, it's called- and we're nearly uh, done, so bear with us. Yeah, we, this is, I think, the last slide. Uh, Long-term long -term equity 
anticipation securities. So that's just a fancy word for like, uh, it's, it's any options contract that's expiring like six months or some people use a year away from expiration. Like, so it's, it's got like maybe a year on expiration. That's, that'd be classified as a leap. Uh, it's like the closest you'll get to um, emulating what shares do. Shares don't have an expiration, but um, you can use leaps to like, if you're long-term on a company. All right, so yeah. Um, I guess this is up for you guys to decide what you learned, but um, hopefully you learned what a mutual uh, fund and index fund are, uh, the difference between them. And the, um, that options are leveraged by 100. So 100 shares, each contract is 100 shares. Uh, options expire. The right so for 100 shares. You have the right for 100 shares, sorry. Um, options expire, uh, unlike shares. And hopefully not to get IV crushed in the future, because I guarantee it will happen to you if you trade options. All right. Any questions on any any part of it, including like stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, options? I know we ended up spending a lot of time on stocks and options. Um, ETFs, though, are if you probably your safest bet if you're looking for just something quote unquote safe. Um, but yeah. Hopefully that was helpful for all of you. And if there are no questions, then I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and stop the recording. Thank you all for coming. I hope that was helpful. Thank you.